Well, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm so glad that you are here. This is a delight. We've been really looking forward to this evening uh, or this morning. Um, and so we, uh, we're we going to spend about an hour together today, uh, give or take, uh, probably maybe a little bit less than that. And then uh, if you'd like to hang out and hang with old friends, you're always very welcome to do that, of course. Um, <clears throat> if I haven't met you, my name is Tim. Uh, I am the CEO of Impact Nations. Impact Nations uh, uh, was founded by my dad, who uh, is here, and my mom, who is lost to me, but she's out there somewhere on the I'm couch. <laughs> uh, there you are. Um, got a lot of cameras on here. Um, if you are new to Impact Nations, or maybe you just want to be reminded of what we're all about as a global family, uh, we are exactly that. We are a global family that uh, together we believe that the gospel is big enough and powerful enough to transform every part of life. Uh, and so we uh, go about rescuing lives with a really big gospel is like how we like to say it. Um, we are rescuing lives in a lot of different ways, but primarily we're rescuing people from very dangerous situations, whether that be human trafficking, um, forced prostitution, homelessness, teen pregnancy, domestic abuse, slavery, gang violence. Um, and we are helping people become self-sustained. So we rescue them from the danger. Uh, and then we get them the skills, the counseling, the mentorship, the coaching that they're going to need to flourish long term. Um, <clears throat> we are uh, also about providing uh, relief to communities that are uh, facing disasters and things like that, uh, bringing food and clean water, medicine, shelter as quickly as we can uh, when there's a need. We're excited tonight to introduce you guys to our newest partners. One of the things that Impact Nations uh, prides itself on is working with leaders, partnering with leaders in the developing world, partnering with leaders who are in these communities, uh, who are seeing the kingdom of God come each and every day of participating in kingdom restoration and rescue. We get to come alongside and say, man, we love what you're doing. How can we help? Our job as a global family is to build capacity. Uh, it's to come alongside and say, hey, uh, we're, we can bring some capital to this project, but also we can bring some know-how, some experience, uh, perhaps some curriculum, some training, things like that, helping even with budgeting and project planning, um, uh, HR, all of these things, so that our amazing partners can just do more and more of what God has called them to do. So tonight we're really excited because we're actually introducing you to some of our newest partners. Uh, we've been working with Pastor Mark and with Richard in in Malawi for uh, I don't know maybe a year and a half, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it off to Dad just to talk a little bit about the genesis of that relationship, uh, some of his time there because he's actually been to Malawi a couple times. Mom was there once as well. I've yet to go. I'm gonna be with many of you guys in April. Really looking forward to that. But I thought I'd hand it off to Dad real quick just to talk about uh, some of his time uh, with these two remarkable men, and then we'll we'll pass it off to them. So Dad, I will get you to take it away. Hi everybody. Um, and I'm delighted to see that Mark has just come on. Have we got? Have you got a brighter light, Mark? You look, you look like a, a, just a silhouette. If you could put a light in front of you, that would be perfect. But at any rate, uh, this silhouette is Pastor Mark, and this man is Richard. Um, Mark got in touch with me um, quite a long time ago, maybe uh, twenty minutes. months ago. And uh, I guess he'd heard about us, um, I think probably from the website, but he, he invited uh, he invited Christina and I to come uh, to Malawi, and we get a lot of invitations, and we, we, we usually are kind of in a place where we, we just say, I'm sorry, we can't come, because we do everything relationally. The thing is that, and this happened in Colombia a few years ago, too, for those of you who were with us in Colombia, I felt like... And as did Tim and Christina, we felt strangely like we're supposed to say yes. And so we went to, we went to Malawi, Christina and I, and uh, we got to spend a little time with them. We uh, taught, I think they gathered, I don't remember, 450 pastors maybe or more. And uh, we, we had a really good time. And I thought, let's pursue this a little bit. So we uh, we did a small uh, mosquito net project together <clears throat> last year uh, in September. I went again, and this time I went with Craig, who's one of the blocks up here. I just can't see them all right now. And uh, we went we went in there for I'm not sure a week, nine days, something. And uh, we had a terrific time, not only relationally. 
but um, getting to see what they've done after Cyclone Freddie. Many of you will remember that a year ago, almost in March, there was this terrible sustained cyclone. Um, actually, the longest sustained cyclone in recorded history, which is remarkable. And uh, in the Palomba area where, where Richard and Mark work, um, there were 58,000 who uh, immediately became homeless and no water source, no food. So we got to work, thanks to many of you and, and I think hundreds others, we were able to get funds to them to get uh, food distributed because folks were just getting close to starving, I guess, and water. And and I think somewhere here is Josh Smith. I just can't see everybody right now, but Joshua went over kindly for us. He's done this before in India with 200 filters. And so that was terrific. Um, well, when we went in uh, September, October, Craig and I, I got to see just the amazing work that these two brothers had done. Uh, coordinating. It's one thing for us to send them the funds. It's another to coordinate getting food and shelter and clean water, which, by the way, they probably got access to maybe 15,000, 12,000 people with clean water. Not only that, um, we met their team. Um we asked, they have a team, uh, 10 teams working with anti-trafficking at 10 different border crossings. And I, I met with the lady who heads that up and you'll hear more about that. I, I don't want to tell you everything, but, but um, out of that, they're rescuing women. Uh, there's, they'll tell you about a new tailoring school that's just opened and so forth. What I want to say is, and besides that, uh, Mark, I don't know what it is now, but when I saw you a few months ago, it was up to 80 churches planted. And, um, and I, you know, I got to work with all these pastors that, that Mark's raised up. Richard, they have a unique partnership. Uh, Mark, uh, really, you know, he oversees, it's apostolic, really oversees this growing network of churches. And Richard is the absolute point person for projects. He works very closely with government um, at national, regional level. I met tribal government people. So their, their combination of gifting uh, makes them really high capacity. And I, I won't tell you all they've got done. I'll let you, I'll let them tell you that. But I'm really excited. And this has accelerated. They have become major, major partners for us. And um, I love just being on the phone and talking and, and getting excited together about what God is doing. So I'll, uh, I'll pass it on now. Uh, I think I guess I'll pass it. I'll pass it off to whichever one of you wants to go first, Mark or Richard. Yeah, pa Pastor Mark, uh, if you could maybe just kind of tell us a little bit about uh, Rivers of Life organization and, uh, and how you guys got started and what you're all about. Thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to know if you are getting me. Are you hearing me? Yes. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Uh, my name is uh, Pastor Mark Zimbiri. Born and raised up in the Migowi Palombe district. And I came to the Lord when I was very young at the age of, at the age of 11. Uh, that was in 1989. Since then, I had a passion to serve the Lord. And in 1997, I had to found the Good News Outreach Church because there was no any charismatic or a church that could preach the true gospel in my village because the churches that were there were only the Catholic and other traditional churches. So I had a passion and a desire to establish a church, a ministry that will serve the community both in way and deed. And um, uh, from 1997, 
I founded the Good News Outreach Church and uh, we have been out preaching the gospel both in the country and outside of the country, more especially our neighboring country of Mozambique. In 2007, the Lord spoke to me because it was evident that the people that we were serving then had also some physical challenges, some physical needs. Yes, we were reaching them with the word of God, but still they had a need physical, physically. The needs surrounded areas such as health, agriculture, youth, women, and girls empowerment, and also, there is this is, um, modern day slavery, which is being called human and sex trafficking, which is now looming in our communities and beyond. So from 1997, uh, from 2007 more especially, we began an organization called the River of Life Organization, which is mainly focusing on the humanitarian side of a human being. So what do we do through the River of Life Organization, much as we preach the gospel through the good news outreach, River of Life is reaching out to humankind through the provision of health care services in our communities. And also we are empowering the youth through the provision of skills, uh, bricklaying, carpentry and designing, tin smith, tailoring and, uh, and, and designing carpentry and joinery, welding and fabrication, hair dressing, which is a saloon, and also electrical installation. Uh, this is what so far is being provided through our training center. As I have already stressed to you that uh, uh, 10 years ago, we had experienced some of our young girls and boys and young men, women, being lured by other evil people who are coming into our communities, convincing our young people that when they go into the cities or other countries, they want to get uh, good jobs. What they, we call these green pastures. But unfortunately, when they go there, they find themselves at a corner because what they were promised to be canon is no longer canon. We have lost so many young girls, beautiful girls. Others, they have come back through some other programs and repatriation services, but still we are missing others, many of them who could not even get transport back into Malawi. Because when they go to such countries and areas, their passports and traveling documents are confiscated, they're grabbed, such that they cannot access. And also, some of them, they are being used as sex workers, prostituting, and the benefits goes to the perpetrators. So the River of Life, established a program which is targeting and focusing on victim support, rescuing, and also we thank God by that uh, impact nation so far has helped us a lot to come up, up with a safe house and also to, to revamp our tailoring uh, sector, providing uh, tailoring skills to about 60 youth so far. And the target is that we are risking about 25 young girls each and every month, of which 16, about 16 of them, they require services 
such as psychosocial counseling and also uh, spiritual counseling um, to rebuild them, to restore them back uh, uh, to their normal uh, human being. Um, the Good News Outreach has got pastors who serve with, along with the River of Life organization to provide spiritual uh, uh, counseling. While we have also some expatriates who come along with us to provide psychosocial support to these victims who are being rescued each and every month through our supporting uh, volunteers who are working in the border uh, areas between Malawi and Mozambique. And also so far we are penetrating into the borders of Zambia and Tanzania. I think we will report on this as we go along. But um, this is the background where we are coming from. The Good News Outreach Church is serving with about 200 plus pastors, both within the country and also in the country of Mozambique. And we have a network of more than 1,000 pastors who come also uh, to work with us from other denominations and ministries. We conduct leadership and missions conferences each and every quarter of the year where we train, we empower, we equip, we motivate pastors and leaders through so many uh, leadership conferences, missions conferences, and also seminars and forums. That's, I think, the background uh, of the good news as well as uh, the River of Life organization. Thank you. Thank That's you. fantastic, Pastor Mark. Thank you so much uh, for just giving us a real good picture of what you guys, where you've come from, where you're going, uh, and some of the issues you guys are dealing with. Um, Richard, as as project manager, you're overseeing a lot of different things, and I know you work really closely with uh, some of our team members here at Impact Nations, uh, Jordan, our project manager, and uh, Bill, who oversees Journeys of Compassion, plus all of our water filters and, and food and garden programs. Um as as you guys have been just engaged in rescue uh, just in the last year, maybe, could you just share a couple of stories uh, that really stick out to you uh, where somebody was just had their life radically transformed from, from the path that they were on? Uh, thank you so much, uh, the Impact Nations family. Uh, it's good uh, uh, to be here and the family together. Uh, I'm Richard. Muruzi, the project's uh, manager for River of Life organization. Uh, I think Pastor Mark has eroded a number of um, activities that we are engaged on. Uh, basing on the issue of the uh, uh, human trafficking, uh, mostly it's the rescue, interception, and also making sure that we are able to repatriate and integrate the survivors of human trafficking in their uh, families. Just to add on that, uh, we have had a number of girls that were uh, trafficked into the cities uh, of, of, of Malawi we've been, and uh, we worked closely with the government department, uh, which is the social, uh, the social welfare offices, to track these uh, young girls and make sure that they've been rescued and also repatriated back to their respective um, uh, places. And this is where we came up now with an idea looking at what can we empower them so that they should, we should also break the human trafficking cycle. Because uh, when we dig deeper, these traffickers, they target uh, those households that are experiencing food shortages and the like. These are the most targeted households. Mm -hmm. So we needed now to start empowering these young, young, young girls and also the boys that have been rescued so that we could empower them with doing something. That's when the idea of bringing back the terrorism school is coming in so that we are targeting uh, almost 65% of the, of the students, uh, the young girls, young women, mostly that have been uh, rescued from uh, human trafficking. So in addition to that, 
this has escalated because uh, in Malawi, as you know, we experienced the cycle freight. Uh, this has been the worst uh, Malawi has ever uh, faced. Uh, that was in March 2023. So this has also eluded the gains that the households have uh, able uh, they gained for the past past period. So these families that are in dire need, and this is now um, a problem and a challenge that these households they will be targeted again for these young girls and boys to be lured to work uh, with the promise that they can get because these people they use promises which they never fulfill. So it's now high time that we are working hard together with the border monitors and also transit monitors that checks, especially in the uh, bus stations because trafficking also involves transportation. So we did a, engaging with these transporters and even those people that are working within the bus stations or taxi stations uh, to be able to report very fast to the law enforcers, which we are working uh, with. So this is, uh, uh, I, I was explaining on the second freight. We thank uh, Impact Nations came quickly to help us with the uh, uh, 200 uh, water filters. And we managed also to buy water buckets, at least to provide clean water to the people who survived from the cyclone because this prevented the escalating of waterborne diseases. And um, we are thanking that Impact Nations will be also distributing uh, 300 water filters. That's why we have targeted uh, to the also uh, targeting uh, these, these, these families. And previously, uh, before Cyclone, we distributed uh, mosquito nets. Uh, and it was distributed in a good time because in Malawi, mostly December, January, and February, there is high increase of malaria, case, malaria cases. So this helped much a lot uh, in the reduction of the malaria cases uh, 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 in, in the area where we are working. And also the food distribution that we also reached to the survivors of cyclone, this helped much because the people, they were able now to start thinking uh, the way of standing up again. Yes, the disaster has happened, but life has to go on. So we brought in the hope to them, and we thank the pastors and other church members that provided the cycle, that cycle of social support because people, they, they really needed the spiritual support in this uh, dire uh, 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 time, which we are continuing up to date because the devastating of the cyclone was very huge, which we believe that uh, it would take months or years to bring back uh, the people because uh, most of the area where we went with Pastor Steve, um, almost 60% of good land that people benefited much. They were growing their own food. It's, it's all mud. There is mud, almost three meters. So this is the way- Three meters of mud. Of mud, yes. So there is they've lost quite of um, available land, the rich land that these people they were able to produce their own food the whole year round. So this is uh, we have what we know a big uh, work to do, which we believe that with prayer and the support coming in, we are going to resuscitate and make sure that the people that we were empower. So this is what I wanted to add on on, on, on what Pastor Mark uh, mm. has, has explained. Yeah, thank you. Richard, this has been really helpful. Thank you. I've, I've got two kind of follow-up questions for you. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you were just talking about Cyclone Freddy and, and three meters of mud, which I think is really hard for the human mind to even comprehend that much depth of mud that wasn't there before uh dad i'm gonna pass it to you real quick because you were actually there um it, just a few months afterwards uh to see some of that damage and maybe you could just describe to to folks what you saw there and um and i know you and and pastor mark and richard uh had some encounters with people who had been rescued during during the effort um dad what what was it like seeing some of the the disaster zone it was uh 
it was actually in a sensory way hard to take in uh, I, I was particularly struck, I think, by three things. One, there had been a river, and it was now nothing but boulders. I don't know if we have a picture of that, but but just tens and tens of thousands of boulders, some of them the size of a car, completely obliterating. And they came down from a mountain that was probably uh, six or seven kilometers away, and it was just gone. The second one was um, where there had been a community and their market was, as as Richard said, it was buried in at least three meters of mud. But this mud, because it had gravel and stuff in it, which also came down from the mountains, had uh, solidified. It was like concrete. It was like concrete. So it was, and there'd been this whole community market, a whole area, houses, they're gone. And the third thing, and I probably would, would love for maybe Mark to tell you more about this, but the third thing was when Craig and I went to see some of the houses where uh, Josh Stewart, uh, Stewart, sorry, I have a Josh was Stewart. Josh was Smith, who's out there somewhere. Um, when he brought the filters, they wanted to show us how they were being used. And uh, we encountered people that were um, sharing the clean water with uh, up to 100 people from their one filter. And uh, so that re those things really just hit me. And houses where the walls were just gone, roofs gone, everything. But there was one story, and, and Mark and Richard and I have talked about that, one of these women who received a filter and was also one of those who was sharing it with about 100 people a day. But but this lady was an entrepreneur and uh, it's about mm -hmm. sustainability. Do, do you want to share that, Mark, that the story of that woman with the, uh, the tea house? Yes, Richard, can you take that one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, um, these are the some of the women that survived from the cyclone fray, and it really encouraged us, encouraged us much because uh, this lady and her three children was housed at her brother's house soon after the cyclone fray because she lost um, her house, but. She didn't think, uh, lie down and saying that I could get support everywhere. She thought of starting a small business, which her brother helped us, uh, helped her to start that small business of selling tea to the community around at a small trading center. This is one of the resilience uh, lessons that we got, that even if uh, the second freight survivors uh, they couldn't rely upon each and every time to get support, but they these are a good example that if pushed, if supported, they can stand on their own. They can look mm -hmm. after their families. Yeah. yeah, so it's a good example of this lady that we are also using that as a model to other uh, cyclone uh, survivors. As we have yeah. already said that the impact, that the negative impact that cyclone brought in would take years. So the other way that we're looking at is empowering through the economic empowerment and also uh, supporting them or giving them skills in, in gardening, which, as we have already said, we have got uh, a, a raw garden that uh, we are using the Thrive Gardening Skills. This main garden, and also we trained other communities surrounding this uh, main garden into they can also start doing homegrown vegetables uh, within. This is another way of uh, making sure that the households are coming uh, to get empowered. And this approach, which we are also looking at, also bring them this year to this area, which was uh, highly hit by cyclone, to give them also the thrive gardening skills, because we mm -hmm. believe that uh, they will be able to produce again the vegetables that they could sell because at first before the, the these people losing land they used to produce their own food the vegetables which people even from cities 
the, the nearest city, that's Blanda city and Zomba city, they used to come and buy from them in Bake. So bring them back. Uh, we believe that this uh, is going to go a long way because yeah. as we've said, keeping them after them, it's going to take much more, much of the time uh, yeah. to get back to their lives uh, normally. And yet, yeah, it, so. it's so clear, Richard, that you guys are uh, ministering from a place of hope rather than victimhood, rather than dwelling on the, oh, this cyclone happened and it's defeated us. Instead, you are, are instilling hope in people, planting seeds of hope uh, that are now beginning to bear fruit I, and making some hard decisions. You know, you, you just mentioned it can take a long time to uh, get the garden up and running and, and begin producing food. And I know we all talk together here and, and with you guys there, your team, uh, shortly after the storm, uh, you know, we, we were able to get food to families very quickly, food packets, groceries, uh, things like that. And, um, and yet, that only lasts so long that's perishable food uh and so maybe we were able to get two or three weeks worth of food to to many many people in those opening weeks but then uh we had a difficult decision to make after that uh with limited resources we had to decide do we want to do another round of feeding like that or do we want to make the hard decision and actually begin to plan for the future? And you guys really embraced that. We're looking at a picture here of people reestablishing uh, gardens. Uh, and that's, that is very, very difficult labor uh, to dig those gardens. And yet they, they put in the, the blood, sweat and tears, if you will, uh, to establish those gardens. And now all these months later, you're really seeing the benefit of that, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, that, and yeah. that's the way that we are. We need to go. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I love how you guys, everything you do, you're really with an eye towards sustainability, towards uh, addressing a long-term need, even with the human trafficking. And I want to come back to that in just a second, Richard, but with the human trafficking, you guys are intervening in the moment. And yet you're also recognizing that, hey, this is actually a symptom of an economic need. And so if we can provide, uh, if we can provide skills training, if we can provide nutrition through the gardens, the uh, draw to go to uh, greener pastures, as as Pastor Mark said a few minutes ago, uh, really uh, is greatly diminished, and they are able to stand on their own two feet with dignity, uh, and they don't need to look to a, a supposed better life that is really just trapping them. Um, Richard, can you explain for me, I, I've been telling people about just the heroic way that you guys are rescuing people who are really in the process of being trafficked. You mentioned a few minutes ago about transportation being a big part of that, uh, whereby uh, you're you're recognizing trafficking happening at the borders and stuff like that. I think sometimes we hear uh, human trafficking and people being rescued from that, and we immediately, our minds think of, you know, armed gunmen coming in, you know, uh, armed militia coming in and storming a, a house where people are being held captive or something like that. But you guys are really operating right at the borders just as it's happening. Can you just talk to us, what does it look like to rescue, how do you recognize human trafficking and how do you stop it? Okay, thank you very much. Um, human trafficking is one of the very well uh, organized crime. It's part of the drug trafficking and even wildlife trafficking. These are well coordinated, systematic, and well organized crime. So um, the thing is, uh, what happens for the people that they want? Because they use us, normally they use other people. That the ones which normally they are well known to the persons. So they use this kind of people. It's not the stranger coming in into the community, but they use the very same uh, young people or men that they can use. Because after taking uh, these young boys and girls, they get a reward in a, in a monetary uh, part. So what happens is like that the ones that also organize the transport for these uh, traffic patients. So what happens at the team that we have, they were trained uh, by the police by the time that we were setting up. One other thing that they detect is the movement of the people. Normally they move in a group of three, four, five. So 
they were also trained how to talk with them. They all normally stop them and ask them where they're going, what are they going to do, where are they coming from. So when they see that the, some of the questions that they're answering in an abnormal way, a red flag is engaged that no, these persons are in danger of being trapped. And that's the period that these people are connected with the law enforcer. They report to the police directory and the police comes in and make the arrest. So most of the time, these traffickers are very clever. Sometimes they could use the trafficked persons, one leader within themselves as victims, giving them transport money. So they communicate through the phones. So what happens is like when these have been rescued or intercepted, we make sure that the phones that are using that closely checked. And that's when they find that they were communicating with other member to cross the border. So these are mm -hmm. some of the uh, skills that uh, the law enforcers train uh, these transit monitors, these border monitors to, to be vigilant most of the time. But mostly yeah. they use, when they suspect, they stop them, ask questions, and the red flag they are raised if they see some elements of being trafficked, some elements of being lewd or being promised with uh, good salaries, whatever. These are some of the needed critters that they use that these people are being trafficked. And that's yeah. where the law enforcement comes in. Yeah. So that's what and we I, have managed. It's it's remarkable. And and you guys have seen a significant growth in your rescue rate. I know that uh <clears throat> one of the one of the projects we were able to partner with you in uh in the last few months of the year of 23 was purchasing mobile phones for each of these teams that are engaged in exactly that process you just talked about so that they can very quickly reach the authorities and get them there that much sooner to to prevent it. And I know that's uh increased your rescue rate, um, yes. which is great. But we we now have uh, a bit of a problem because uh, we are now rescuing many people who perhaps don't have anywhere to turn. So I'd I'd love to talk to you guys a little bit about the year to come. Where are we headed? What what are some of your dreams and goals as you guys have been talking together with your team on the ground uh, in Palumbe and and with our team here at Impact Nations? What are you guys looking forward to uh, in the year to come? Uh, and I'd really love to hear a little bit more about specifically the, the human trafficking and, and once they're rescued, what happens then? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we started explaining that uh, we are looking this year that we continue provision of the uh, water filters, water buckets for clean water, uh, because that's the way that would help even the government in the eradicating of waterborne diseases, especially cholera. So uh, this is another way and recommended by the uh, the health department, which we also work with them uh, in making sure that we are able to provide some of the needs, uh, especially on prevention. Prevention is a key, which means of health also uh, promotes uh, than treating because as Malawi, we are facing a, a, a drug shortage uh, because of uh, a number of things, the high population and all that. So prevention is a remarkable way that government is promoting. So we are taking part in the prevention of waterborne diseases through the uh, 300 filters and packets that we have targeted uh, uh, to do. We have also talked about the sustainable thrive gardens expanding to the mostly a heat uh, cyclone area because the, although part of it was uh, affected, but we still have some pockets of land, which is allowable, which is can be uh, used to help the people come back to their life, be able to produce their own meals and also sell some of, some of, the, of the things. Uh, on the issue of um, human trafficking, this is attached also to the so in school, because some of the rescued uh, young women and girls, we needed to empower them as well. We have already said, we want to break the cycle of, of re-trafficking again into the system. So this is another part that we're looking 
very hard that at least in 2024, we'll be able to train uh, 120 uh, young women and girls uh, in two semi-degree stars because we target to train them in six months. That's what we are looking at. At the same time, we'll be able uh, to give them loans in the form of equipment, sewing machines, so that they could do start their own business because that's what we're looking at. Yes, we train them, uh, but what our goal is to make sure that they're able to start their own business. That's the aim because there is market yeah. out there, uh, which uh, is not fully uh, fulfilled. There is a still a gap uh, yeah. on that one. So we are, we, are, we are looking at, at, at that. Uh, on yeah. the human trafficking part, uh, we thank uh, Impact Nations for supporting the, the work so that we could have a safe house in place so that these victims are able to have a shelter. Because even those some that they come from a long distance, because some we could even rescue them coming far away a minimum of 100 kilometers or 150 kilometers away. So we needed them in the safe house because before repatriation, they need also to testify in courts because some of the victims, we intercepted them with the traffickers, which normally the police, they handle that, but the victims has to uh, give to be a witness to testify in court yep. before being repatriated. So this safe house is going to provide that shelter and the few days, some of them will be with us. The psychosocial support, the spiritual counseling will be provided at the safe house. So on that's that one, beautiful. that's what we, 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 are, we are working on so yeah. hard. For those it's, that uh, require and uh, register into the sewing machine, they're going to be there for six months at the safe house to get trained. Yeah, yeah that's that these beautiful. Are such, are a, such a holistic approach. I, I love it, Richard. Thank you so much. We're we're very, very excited to see what God's going to do this year. And you guys have been doing these some of these programs for many years. We're just excited to come alongside, cheer you on, uh, and, and play a small role in, in helping you uh, see those programs grow. Um, just as we, we wrap up our time together, Pastor Mark, I'm going to bring it back to you. One of the biggest things that's coming in 2024, many of us here are are extremely excited about it, is the journey of compassion to Malawi. This is our first ever journey of compassion to Malawi. Uh, and I'd really love it if you, Pastor Mark, could just talk to us about what you're anticipating, not just on the practical side, although I know we're we're looking at distribution of water filters and we're going to see, I think, some of our largest medical clinics ever, um, but also what are you sensing in the spirit in terms of how the gospel is going to penetrate these communities that we're going to visit? Thank you so much, Tim. Um, uh, there is a great anticipation from this end because uh, the Journal of Compassion, among others, is bringing and is coming to restore hope uh, in a community that lost hope in life. Uh, as you may be aware that uh, the community that we serve has gone through so many life challenges, uh, right from HIV AIDS, um, our community has was declared in the past to be one of the highest in terms of prevalent threat. It was about 20 out of 100, and now we are at a 14 out of 100. So it's an impoverished, uh, impoverished area in terms of um, disease infection, HIV AIDS and other sexual transmitted disease because of high level of poverty. You know, that we are talking of extreme poverty. Uh, um, uh, so the coming in of uh, the Journal of Compassion, I see it as it is coming to restore hope that has been lost uh, by the community. Uh, on top of that, um uh we see uh divers because the people that are coming the uh people who are skilled in different uh areas such as health agriculture uh, rescuing and also preaching teaching uh we see that at one go our communities are going to benefit um uh you know we we will be having 
uh, doctors and nurses uh, who will be coming uh, to join with our local doctors and nurses. We see that there will be impartation of knowledge from the international uh, uh, kind of um, uh, 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 people into our local people that uh, as soon after the journey of compassion, our 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 doctors, our nurses will, will be advanced in terms of service to the people in our community. And also, because there will be outreaches, preaching of the gospel, we see that many of our people will be able to hear the word of God uh, for the very first time in their life. They are being served uh, physically, and also their spiritual needs are being met at the same time. So we are going to benefit a lot. And as you have heard from Richard, uh, that the Thrive Gardens are also one of the, uh, the areas that we see that our community is going to benefit. So far, we are feeding hundreds of people through the gardens uh, that are in the communities through the trainings that we are conducted uh, uh, at our center by uh, uh, Thrive Gardens uh, partners. So you can see that a, a community that was starving, which was failing to bring food on their tables, now is beginning to have food on their tables, feeding their children, uh, sending uh, their children to schools because there is a benefit from the gardens. Um, uh, uh, I, I think uh, it's a God and uh, it's a God's timing and also a divine moment for our community. Uh, Tim, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm overjoyed. I can't express much because I am full of joy to see, to welcome uh, this uh, uh, great event which is going to impact our our country uh, uh, and our community uh, as a whole. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. Pastor Mark, can you talk to us? It sounds to me like we're going to see many, many, many people turn to Christ uh, as they, uh, as you said, we're, we're going to meet their physical needs uh, and and practically demonstrate the gospel. But also they are going to be uh, receiving a touch from the Lord, encountering the love of Christ, uh, some of them perhaps awakening to, to his love for them for the very first time. Um, with that many people uh, turning to Christ in this in this journey, what do you guys have in terms of strategies to make sure that nobody falls through the cracks, that we really are making disciples so that there's long-term kingdom transformation happening long after our team has left and, and you guys are continuing to work in the community? Uh, Tim, uh, that's um, one of the key area that our ministry is looking and taking it into uh, a very serious consideration because uh, at uh, many times, what we have seen in Africa is that bigger crusades have been conducted, but yeah. the biggest challenge comes on the follow-up uh, strategy. So right now, we are meeting pastors from each and every area uh, where the journeys of compassion will, will visit and conduct such uh, 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 meetings. Uh, what we are doing so far is that we are, are preparing psychologically uh, these pastors and leaders uh, to be eager to take over uh, uh, soon after the journeys of compassion the following week all these pastors all these church leaders should take on the, this responsibility of making sure that they are following up each and every person that had received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because it we don't want uh, to, uh, to experience a lost opportunity. This is a, an opportunity uh, uh, to our people and we do not, and, and to these churches around. So we do not want to lose anybody. Soon after the journeys of compassion, as the team leaves, we will be on the ground. We'll be on our two toes, making sure that we are, are making follow-ups. Each and every person, each and every house, each and every community has been followed up with these men and women who are on the ground locally to make sure that we have we have been able to disciple each and every soul that made a decision during the journeys of compassion. 
Come on. I love it. It sounds like you guys yeah. have thought this through very well. Uh, I know you've got, uh, like, uh, we had over 80 pastors, I think, gather when Dad and Craig were there a few months ago to to get some training and stuff like that. So uh, there will be uh, many, many people there to make disciples. Uh, and I, I believe this is going to be uh, a journey that it has just ramifications for years and years and years to come. So, um, I know many who are on this call tonight uh, or this morning, depending on what side of the planet you're on, uh, have already registered or are thinking about registering. If you haven't yet registered, uh, come on, join us. It's going to be incredible. Uh, and you're going to get to minister alongside these two kingdom champions. Uh, and so you don't want to miss that. Um, I think what we're going to do, I'm just aware of the time, guys. I think what I'd like to do is uh, just have a time of of prayer for a couple minutes. And um, mom, I don't and, uh I'm not sure if it's Debbie or Bill working things, but maybe we can just bring all the cameras back for, for now. Um, I, I'd love it if, uh, Mung, you could open in prayer for these guys. And then I'd, I'd really appreciate it if just a couple other folks, uh, if you feel comfortable uh, asking to unmute and somebody will unmute you and, and just pray over these men. And then, Dad, uh, if you could close us in prayer. And then I, I'm sure there are questions, so I'd, I'd really like to make this time available uh, for questions as well. But I just I want to make sure that I'm honoring the time and we're getting close to the top of the hour. So, um We'll, I think we'll close in prayer and then we'll, we'll just leave it open. And if you guys have questions, uh, uh, then you can, you can ask the questions or, or just hang out and say hi and stuff too. So, um, I don't have cameras yet on my screen, but, um, mom, if you're able to, okay, yep. awesome. If you could get us started and then again, please just a few people, uh, get yourself unmuted when I'm not sure how the tech works here, but, uh, if you need to ask to unmute or what have you, um, but unmute yourself and, and just pray, a a prayer blessing if you have a prophetic word or something i'm sure that these these amazing uh men kingdom champions would be greatly blessed to hear your prayer so mom take it away father we thank you for this unique opportunity tonight together as a family and to hear about what you are doing and what you will do in malawi we thank you lord for pastor mark and for richard and all the work that they've done in their communities and Lord, we pray a hedge of protection around them as they continue to prepare for the team to come. We ask that you would strengthen their bodies, that you would protect them and their families, that you would continue to gather those that need to support them in the work that uh, will be done when we're there. Lord, for those of us who can't be there, we ask that you would remind us to pray to support them um, as the, the team comes. Lord, we thank you uh, for the work that's being done to establish a safe house. Lord, I thank you that um, we're going to be able to support them with some of what we've been doing in, in Uganda with just strategies how to bring healing. And so we look forward to those opportunities. And Father, I pray that um, as we continue to strengthen the relationship with them, you would provide more and more opportunities to reach out into their communities, to share the gospel, and to share the practical love of Jesus. Lord, I pray for the team that's going, that uh, you would protect them from any uh, plans of the enemy to stop that from happening, that you would keep them healthy and strong, that you would provide all the finances that are needed for the team that's going. And uh, we just count it a great privilege, Lord, to be able to partner with Mark and with Richard. Amen. Amen. Uh, am I allowed to speak? Yes. Oh, God bless you. Hi, I'm April. I'm a new supporter. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for salvation. Thank you for your son died on the cross for us, God. Father, I thank you for this um, ministry, this organization both sides. Father, I thank you for the leader, his father and mother. Thank you for the dedication. Thank you for your saving mercy and grace that has kept us here today, Lord God, to this day after the Lord was created. Thank you, Jesus. 
Father, I pray right now for the leadership in Jesus Christ's name in Malawi. I pray, Lord God, right now that you release all your angels, hallelujah, over Malawi, Lord God. Forgive, let the blood of Jesus cover everyone in Malawi, Lord God, no matter what they have done, Jesus. Extend mercy to every person, Lord God, and the call that help can come, Lord God. And I pray that the unity you want to see on earth, Lord God, will be manifest right now in Jesus Christ's name. Lord, we come to your throne right now. We come boldly to the throne of grace so we can receive mercy and help us come need. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we stand in agreement, Lord God, not just in Malawi, but for the whole of Africa, Lord God. And we represent all of sin that Satan cannot accuse us, Lord God. Father, we stand in the gap for those who don't know, Lord God, in Jesus Christ's name. Father God, your son died for the sins of everybody. Father God, he said in the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do, Lord God. So for the ones... Hallelujah, who are still laying in sin right now. Thank you, Lord God. You're sick. Your Bible says they all have sin and fall into your Lord. Jesus, I feel the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Oh, uh, Thank you. Someone else want to pray? Yeah, thank Father. You, no. Father, I thank you for all that you're going to do on this journey. And Lord, even as I heard Mark and Richard talk about hope, that was one of the words that you gave me as I prepared the declaration that we're going to be praying over this land. And I felt that you said that you're going to raise up the poor and needy and that you're going to raise up your people to shine, that you're going to give them a hope and a future. And Lord, I just declare these things over Malawi and over Pastor Mark and, and Richard and their ministry. Lord, I pray that as you're gathering your team, that you have your mighty warriors, Lord, that are going to come alongside mighty warriors that are already on the ground and that we will gather together shoulder to shoulder, Lord, and push in to see your kingdom come. And we pray that nothing would stop what you want to do, that you would empower uh, Richard and Pastor Mark and our team, and that we would see great kingdom transformation while we're there, but that would go on and on, ripples coming out from the little stones that we drop into the, into the lake would come out, there would be ripples coming out for years and years after, and we just pray blessing on all those that are going to be part of this and those that are not part of it that will be praying for us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Father, I pray that you would, uh, I believe you're telling me you want to change the reputation of Malawi, that it would not be the place most hit by AIDS, that it would not be known as the poorest nation in, in Africa, that it would not be known as a place where so much uh, human trafficking goes on. Father, we as we enter that nation from the nations, we ask that not only would we bring hope and freedom, but that actually um, the reputation would change. We pray for miracles. We pray for um, powerful healings to take place. And we thank you in advance for all that you're going to do. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Father, I just pray now in the name of Jesus and in the authority of his name, we speak to the nation of Malawi. And we say, in the visible and the invisible realm, we say, open up your gates that the mm -hmm. King of Glory may come in in a fresh wave of who he is. We speak to the nation and we say, receive the kingdom of the heavens. We speak to the nation and we speak healing and restoration. We speak justice. Let justice flow like a river in Malawi. And Lord, in your name, we specifically speak right now to Mark and to Richard, even as I'm looking at them on my screen, I speak to you, my brothers, and I tell you that the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is upon you, and we say, let it increase. How many can say amen to that? Amen. Increase amen. of anointing, increase of grace, increase of wisdom. Amen. 
Lord, we bless that nation and we bless our brothers. Jesus, we all are gathered here because of you. Thank you for your amazing, amazing goodness. Amen. Amen. Amen.